We'll be uh, starting in just a few minutes in Numbers chapter 14. We're going to look at the first four verses there, then look at some additional verses. But as I was preparing this lesson, um, a song came to my mind that I first heard just a year or two after I got saved, which would have been, I got saved in 76, so it was uh, a few years after that. Now, honestly, I don't think I've heard the song since then. But I've asked Brother, I found it, I Googled it, asked Brother Mike if he could cue it up for us. And I'd like you to hear this song. I think you'll enjoy it, and it also will tie in with the lesson. Thank you, Brother Mike. days of old when the Israelites didn't do as they were told that because of the stubbornness they failed the test when they wavered in faith each time by the whining and the crying for a sign our Lord just simply told them this you just go take another lap around Mount Sinai till you learn your lesson till you stop that whining and you quit you're rebelling till you learn to stand in that day of testing by trusting and obeying the Lord. Have you ever been in a situation where the Lord has told you to wait on Him, but it seemed that you could not remain still? So you start planning what you're going to do because you think the Lord has forgotten you. Just then you hear these words You just go take another lap around Mount Sinai Till you learn your lesson Till you stop that whining and you quit your rebelling Till you learn to stand in that day of testing By trusting and obeying the Lord The other day I heard him say, son, you need to take a step of faith and trust me to carry you through this storm. But when the storm started getting rough, I thought, maybe the Lord wasn't strong enough. So I started doing things on my own. Then I heard, take another lap around Mount Sinai till you learn your lesson. Till you stop that whining and you quit your rebelling. Till you learn to stand in that day of testing by trusting and obeying the Lord. Take another lap around Mount Sinai till you learn your lesson. Till you stop that whining and you quit your rebelling. Till you learn to stand in that day of testing by trusting and obeying the Lord. Yeah, the, I tell you what, I think a lot of us have wasted a lot of time taking another lap around Mount Sinai. Uh, and we're going to look at some of those examples of that. And uh, here in Numbers, talking with the the 12 uh, spies had come back and given their report of that the land truly really was full of milk and honey. Uh, and uh, But the thing is, 10 of them said the people are like giants and we're like grasshoppers. And as you read on earlier in chapter 13 and stuff, uh, you know, they just, uh, m in their hearts, just melted as far as fear of all of this. Now, the thing is, God has been bringing them along for 18 months, I believe it is, to get them to this point. He's done all the plagues that he did on Egypt. He's brought them across the Red Sea on dry ground, dropped the water back on top of Pharaoh's uh, army, uh, then manna and water out of a rock. Uh, he's been taking care of them all along the way. And they knew that God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the land that they had sojourned on, they were to inherit it. 
So all through the years that they had been raised up, they had been taught that that land one day was going to be theirs. And now Moses, uh, God took them out with a powerful hand, used Moses and Aaron as his spokespeople. And then they've been guiding them all this way. And then their hearts just melt at the thought of going into battle. Uh, And we see here in verse 1 of chapter 14, Numbers 14, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Can you imagine? I mean, you'd want to, you know, put your big britch, you know, your big boy britches on. You know, it's just, uh, but the thing is, they cried all night, and the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would to God that we had died in the land of Egypt. I tell you what, I can't remember a time when I'm still on my own two feet. Yeah, there may be big, but I wish I was already dead. I mean, you know, that's pretty, you know, it's really, to me, it's, uh, I don't know, just really whiny. Um, Like that song said, we need to quit whining. And then, uh, would to God that we died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? Uh, and wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return to, uh, unto Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let, him, let us return unto Egypt. In other words, we're going to get rid of Aaron and Moses and set a new captain up, and he's going to, we'll just let him take us back to Egypt. Now, what I believe, uh, when you get to the point that you don't trust God and what he says and that you think you know better, what's the word that pops in your mind? What's, pardon? Yeah, pride. Because obedience requires humbleness. Uh, and also, uh, the more and more I study the book of Hosea as we're doing it in our Sunday school lesson, the thing that comes across to me, the only true way to worship God is through humility. And anything short of that is pride. I know better. Uh, you know, and so the thing is, but the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, that you don't need to turn there. I'm going to read some of it. But basically, when we get locked up in pride... We make fools of ourselves because the sister says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And, you know, how many people really want to go around in their life and at the end of their life sum their whole life up and say, I was a fool? You know, but the thing is, if we live outside the will of God for our lives, that's what we're, the scriptures are just telling. We can be saved, but we can still be fools. Um, by not humbling ourselves and through obedience to God. Um, Then the thing is, some thoughts that ran through my mind, and we're going to look at some other verses here in just a minute, but, you know, um, so they're going to name a new captain, and they're going to have to make the march back to Egypt, but who's going to supply the food and the water? I think if you ask them, they'd say, well, God is, of course. Oh, you just killed uh, the officers that I set up, and you set up a new officers and, uh, you know, and stuff like that, and yet I'm on the hook to take you back? Uh, that's a little bit presumptuous, wouldn't you think? Uh, in fact, you'll see in the scriptures here in just a minute that it was very presumptuous. And um, also, after what God did to Egypt, do you think the Egyptians would even want them back? I'm not ready for seconds on this. I mean, after what God did to him the first time to break Pharaoh down and let him go, um, those people poured out their treasures. People gave their jewels, their gold, their garment. We just want you gone. We're tired of this. And they thought, well, we'll just go back. They'll probably, you know, hug us and we'll have a come be ya moment. And, you know, it'll just all work out. I, you know, it's, it, does it sound foolish? Yeah, when you start thinking for yourself like that, out of the will of God, 
you're going to be a fool. And the thing is, it gets to the point in uh, Joshua and Caleb, the two spies that gave a good report about what they could do. All of them gave a good report that the land flowed with milk and honey. But the two said, we can do this. And when they tried to remind the children of that, look in verse 10 with me. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. In other words, because Caleb and Joshua was telling them that what was true, and they didn't want to hear it, let's just stone them. Boy, they got a tender, loving heart, don't they? Uh, but, you know, here's their presumption. Well, you know, God will have to feed us to go back. He's the one that brought us out here. He's obligated. He's got to feed us all the way back. Well, look with me in what the Lord has in mind for him in verses 11 and 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a great nation mightier than they. In other words, God said, you don't have to worry about the food. You don't have to worry about the water. I'm just going to kill you. You know, <laughs> you know, I've had all of it I want. If you, as you read through the scriptures, early, this is the 10th time they've rebelled against them during this 18-month trip. And God's had all of it he wants. Now, he knows the future, so he knew that Moses would intercede on their part, and he did. And But what they got to do was spend the next, the total of 40 years, but the next uh, 38 and a half years wandering around in the desert until everyone above the age of 20 died, um, except for Joshua and Caleb, who gave a good report. Um, so that's one area where pride caused terrible damage. We're going to see the bright side of this in just a few minutes. But go with me, if you would, next to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10. Now, at this point, they had already asked Samuel to request of God to give him a king. Uh, and... God had chosen Saul, and uh, Samuel had already anointed him with oil. And then he was going to introduce Saul to the nation. So he had all their leaders, everybody show up at a location, and he's going to bring Saul out. And they actually went through a process of doing lots but Samuel already knew who was going to be the winner because God had already sent him to anoint Saul with oil. And it came down that basically Saul was chosen, but they couldn't find him. And uh, in verse 21, of uh, chapter 10, uh, it says, And when he had caused the tribes of Benjamin to come near by their families, and the families of Moriah was taken, and Saul and the son of the son of Kish was taken, and when they sought him, they could not; he could not be found. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should be yet come for hither. And the Lord answered, "Behold, he have hid himself among the stuff." Basically, he was in the back, of the wagon train where everybody had traveled in. They had to bring their bedding, they had to bring their cooking utensils, they had to bring. Uh, all their supplies that they would need from depending on the part of Israel they had traveled from to get to this location. And he was hiding in the, in the baggage train or in the wagon train because of humility, of humbleness. He didn't feel qualified for the job. I mean, God picked a humble man to be king. But the thing is, we... 16 years later, he is sent to destroy the Amalekites. So from being so humble that, I mean, you've already been anointed king. The spirit of God had already come upon him. If you read previous in the chapters here, 
And he, he knew what God wanted him to do, but out of humility, he didn't want, he just didn't feel worthy to step forward to do it. But go with me to, if you would, to um, chapter 15, um, 1 Samuel chapter 15. And God had sent him to uh, destroy the Amalekites and to kill every one of them and kill all their animals and stuff like that because of the wickedness of those people and the fact that they had attacked the children of Israel when they were out in the wilderness. And, um, of course, the report is he comes back and he brings the king back with him alive and he brings back the, the best of all the flocks and the herds. And Samuel has been notified by God that he's going to take the kingdom away from Saul. And then Samuel goes to find Saul. And in verse 12, and it says, uh, chapter 15, And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a place, and is gone about and passed on and gone, gone down to Gilgal. Now, when he says he set him up a place, what he did was he built a war monument to his victory. Now, here's a man in 16 years who's gone from being so humble that he wouldn't come out from among the wagon train to go before the people. God had to tell them where to go find them, and they had to go fetch him. But 16 years of having power and allowing it to go to his head had got him to the point where he disobeyed God and um, didn't do as he said. The One of the reasons uh, he probably kept the king alive, and I'll let you study this on your own later, but in Judges uh, chapter 1 and verse 7, the Canaanites at that time had a deal that this one king, he had 32 kings that he had destroyed their kingdoms, and he'd cut off their thumbs and he'd cut off their big toes. He fed them and kept them alive, but they sit at the end of his, at the, in front of his table. In other words, he, here's all my trophies. He, he, this is my display case of how great a you know, king I am. Here's 32 kings. Well, that was the reason Saul kept Agag alive. He was going to, he was going to be a trophy. He had already set up a war monument to himself to show his great victory, and now he's going to keep a trophy, which had been the king. And so pride has taken over this man. And the, and the problem with it is, is because God chose to strip the kingdom away from him, it meant he was going to eventually lose his life. But when a king dies, who takes the throne? His son. So he, all of his sons had to die too. So it's a high price to pay to allow pride to come into your heart. He was saved. Saul went to heaven. Jonathan, we know, was saved. He went to heaven. But the thing is, that there was a high consequence because of the uh, cost of pride. Now, in the book of Daniel, um, we'll look at chapter 4, if you'll turn there with me. And believe it or not, there's going to be a brighter side to this story in a minute. But um, but I need to lay out these things where people failed in some areas. Now, we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, in chapter 2, um, he had his dream interpreted by Daniel. And the thing is, no one else could tell him the interpretation of the dream but Daniel was able to do it to the letter. So he had this great example. Then he built his uh, idol that he wanted everybody to worship in chapter 3, and the three Hebrew children refused to honor that. And so what did he do to them? Threw them into the fiery furnace, right? And how many people did Nebuchadnezzar see yeah, he saw four people at the bottom of the furnace, and he said one is like the Son of God. And so 
he had this great examples of things. And then he has another dream in chapter 4, and that is there's this huge tree, and it gets cut off, but then they put a steel band around the trunk so it wouldn't be destroyed, and Daniel interprets that dream for him. And that dream is as a warning from God that he's the tree and that because of pride and his unwillingness to glorify God, that he was going to lose his mind for seven years. And so we pick up in chapter 4 in verse 27. Here's Daniel trying to give counsel to the king after he declares to him the purpose of the dream. He says, therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor that it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. That sounds like good advice, doesn't it? And he was able to pull it off for 12 months. And then he started bragging about this great Babylon that I've built and he lost his mind for seven years. And, um, and they basically acted so much like a wild animal, they had to run him out of the kingdom. And he, he ate grass like an oxen. And uh, I mean, to go from king to living out in the pasture somewhere is a, and losing his mind was a pretty dramatic cost for his pride. Um, now we move on into the New Testament. And if you go with me to Acts chapter 13, and in Acts chapter 13 and verse 13, John Mark had gone off with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. And they went out to the Isle of Cyprus and they were there and the work was rough circumstances weren't good, I guess, as far as uh, probably fearful or maybe homesickness. But John Mark quit the work, and he returns. We see in verse 13, Now when Paul and his company were loose from Pappas, they came to Perga, and I can't pronounce the next word, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. He went home to Mama. Uh, he just couldn't handle the work uh, of the ministry. And, you know, the thing is, they had, they had to live dependent on people being hospitable to them and stuff like that. So I'm not going to try to minimize how stressful the work was, but they, um, they had to, um, he, he didn't bear up from it. But the thing for each of us to do, and the reason I wanted that song played, and I'm going to give you some the, uh, the good side of the story here next, is I have found in my life that when God makes up his mind that you're going to do something, guess what? Eventually you're going to do it. Uh, and it's just a matter of how many laps around Mount Sinai do you want to take. Uh, he'll bring you up to something. Uh, a doorway, it'll look fearful. It takes a step of faith. If it takes faith, does it first have to scare you? If it don't scare you, what type of faith would it take to do it? And so the thing is, we have to get to that point where, okay, whatever it is, it scares us to look at. Uh, but we know in our heart God has led us to it. And if we go halfway through the trial and maybe the trial is going to last a year and we go six months into it and then we quit what have we done we've wasted our pain we've wasted whatever it was that the energy we expended the stress that we were under we've wasted that and then we back off and now we're making our laps around mount sinai because God's going to bring you right back up to that same door. It may be dressed different, may have a different look on it, but God's going to bring you right back to that same door. And all that door is, do you trust me enough to step out? And the thing is, if you follow through with it, 
there's areas of your life, because God is faithful to you in that area, that that area of your life will never scare you like it did before. Be it finances, be it health, uh, whatever the circumstance is, God will finally put that worry to rest in your mind because God got you through it. If he did it once, he can do it twice. The thing is, we got to continue to grow. Uh, how many of y'all, as you've gotten older, the, the stresses of life and the concerns you have for others have just gone way, way down? I haven't really found that to be true. Uh, my, the people that I care about and the people that you know I need to be concerned with, my responsibilities have gone up, and with it goes stress. Well, the stress can be took away if you can replace it with faith. And the only way you can replace it with faith is you went and walked through, by the grace of God, whatever that trial was. Well, we see here... Um, in the wilderness, those over the age of 20, other than the two, Joshua and Caleb, died over the next 38 and a half years. But God raised up a new generation of people who truly had to learn to live by faith in the wilderness. Their clothes didn't wear out. God provided their food. God provided their water. He protected them. And that generation marched in and took the promised land with God's help. And so God's will was accomplished, but those one group of people didn't get to uh, participate. They didn't get the joy of it. Um, David got anointed king after uh, Saul. Go with me, if you would, to uh, Psalms uh, 51. I'm going to read a passage here. We'll start in verse 1. David, after the prophet uh, Nathan had came to him and called him out on his sin with Bathsheba and stuff like that, and this is David's song to God, prayer to God, um, and he goes, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from, the, from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified uh, when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in the sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and and in the hidden part, uh, that thou make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to to hear joy and gladness that my bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and behold with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. What a difference in this king and Saul. Saul, he, God picked a, at that time, David may not even been born, or if he was, he was very young. And the thing is, um, he picked the right man. He picked Saul. He was humble at that time, but he let pride in. Here's David, who may have even committed worse sins. But the thing is, he was accountable for it. He went before his God with a humble spirit and asked for forgiveness, where Saul just made excuses. 
And the thing is, he wasn't going to change. His heart wasn't going to change. He was saved, but he wouldn't. God knew he wasn't going to change, and so the kingdom was taken away from him. But he replaced him with a king who, though not perfect by a long shot, when confronted with his sins through humility, went to his father and asked for forgiveness. Nebuchadnezzar, you don't have to turn there, but I will. In Daniel chapter 4, go the right direction, it helps. Um, Daniel chapter 4, in verse 37, after he got his sanity back, in verse 37... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Nebuchadnezzar could swear to that one, couldn't he? Uh, It happened to him. But the thing is, he got praise out of a heathen king who finally came to the saving knowledge of God by losing his mind for seven years. And then God gave it back to him. And we look at um, John Mark, the young man that didn't stand up to the test in the beginning. But uh, we won't turn there for time's sake. But in Acts chapter 15 and verse 39, he goes with his uncle Barnabas out on the mission field. And what else is John Mark known for? He wrote the book of Mark. God allowed him to write the book of Mark. The thing is, failures through pride, failures through just not wanting to do what God wants you to do. And any time you don't want to do what God wants you to do, it is pride. You've, you've thought it through enough and you've figured out you shouldn't have to do that. And so that's, there's, there's, I can't think of any other word to put on it. There's other motivations maybe involved, fear with the Hebrews and stuff, but there's also, there's that pride. I've got a better plan. And every time you do it, it just brings, it makes a fool out of you. It wastes your time it may cost you a high price and like I said um, just like the little song said you get to how many of you really want to spend your time making another lap around Mount Sinai can you imagine how I mean sand got into places sand shouldn't get into Uh, you know it just it could not have been a joyful 38 and a half years that they spent out there. And all these other people just, uh, they allowed pride in and pride cost them. And it makes fools out of us. And at the end of my life, I just don't want them to have to put the epitaph, one big fool. May have been saved. I know I'm saved. But I don't want it to read that uh, I was unwilling to follow God. And so it gets down to the, um, for us, if we find ourselves that there's been things that God has put on our hearts that we ought to do that we have not done, the only person we've sinned against is just like David said, I've sinned against you and you only. And what we have a promise in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have an advocate with the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can have all that took care of and cleaned up, washed away, and then step out by faith and uh, start walking the trail God really wants us to instead of the one that was mentioned in the song. I want to thank you all for your good attention. Brother David Merrick, could I get you to close this word of prayer?